All right, so now let's talk about designing the tieback. Okay, so when we're done with this, you should be able to uh, determine the appropriate uh, lateral earth pressures using the apparent earth pressure diagrams uh, using the FHA, FHWA manual. I, I didn't say this the last presentation, but I've given you the tieback design manual for FHWA, and it's got the whole, it's got all the design procedures for it in there. Um, and then, um, we're not actually, oh, um, I don't think we're actually doing this. I'll take that out. We're not going to be doing that. Um, but anyway, given the soil, uh, soil uh, properties, anchors, and locations, directions, compute the anchor loads. I say compute, you're actually going to be estimating the anchor loads. We'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, using the apparent earth pressure diagrams in either the, the hinge or the tributary area system. Um, and then give, given the characteristics of the material that you're anchoring in, determine what the, what the estimate the bond lengths that are, uh, you're going to need. Uh, and then from that, you should be able to determine the appropriate anchor length, both the bonded length and unbonded length. Um, and then select a, the appropriate tendon elements to create an anchor system. Um, and uh, determine um, the capacity, you know, where are you, where are you going to have to put these anchors so you can mo mobilize the, 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 uh, the um, passive capacity of them, and then finally uh, check that you've got a adequate capacity in those inside the system. All right, so anchor wall the systems. The, the procedure is, the first thing you do is ab establish the initial geometry and the anchor locations. It's very similar to what you do for the brace excavations. You've got to have a design to start with. So the first thing you're going to do is, is look at the overall design of the system and figure out where you think you need anchors and come up with an initial anchor system. Um, and then once you've got your anchors and well, you know how, how many anchors in, then you've got to uh, determine, you'll, uh, uh, you'll select the appropriate earth pressure diagram. We have different, in, in the uh, anchored walls, the earth pressure diagrams depend on the number of anchors that go in. It's not, the, the, the earth pressure diagrams are um, a little more accurate and a little more complex than they are for the, for the braced excavations. Uh, once we've got the, uh, the, once we know the anchor locations in the apparent earth pressure diagram, then we can compute the horizontal anchor loads in the bending moments. Uh, if that's not satisfactory, we'll have to adjust the anchor locations. Um, and uh, once we have the anchorage locations uh, uh, determined, then we have to figure out what the, an the angles are of the anchors and where they're going to be um, anchored to. This is, us this is a function of two things. One, the anchors have to be deep, far enough below the ground surface that you're going to get a good a a passive capacity. You're not actually going to fail the ground surface. And two, there's usually, a there's often obstructions. Sometimes the anchorage links are dependent on getting into more competent material. If you have a very soft material over a stiffer material, then the anchorage links are usually d d driven by trying to get into the, the more competent material. So there's a lot of things that can drive the, the actual an the anchor links and the material that you're anchoring into. Uh, once you have that, we can determine the total anchor loads and the spacing uh, and select the type of anchor. Then once we've got all done, then we've got to go back and check some of the wall uh, issues. We've got to make sure we have enough embedment. One for the bearing capacity at the end of the wall, particularly if you have a steeply, uh, uh, um, if your anchors are going in very steeply, you're going to have fairly large vertical loads applied to the wall, and you've got to make sure you've got enough capacity there. And that may need to be adjusted. Um, then we'll design the anchorage system to determine the bonded and unbonded lengths. And finally, if we want to check displacements with these systems, we can't use the, uh, the uh, well, you could use the, the empirical displacement um, method that, um, that, we dis that, uh, that we discussed used for brace excavations, but it, it will be a very um, conservative estimate of displacements. If you want to get displacements estimated from these things, you really need to do the kind of analysis we've been doing with phase two, but you need to, do, you need to, you need to have really good soil models, which we, were, we discussed earlier how the, the simple uh, elastoplastic models for soils aren't going to give you good displacements within the soil system. Um, then we're going to design our, our, our facing system <clears throat> to, to, to make sure it meets the bending capacities that we got, whatever the lagging system is, and then finally design all the connections and the whales and all that stuff. There's a lot of details in that that, that need to get done. So that's the overall design. Uh, 
So the apparent earth pressure diagrams, diagrams we're going to use. These are essentially modified diagrams from the Trutsagi and Peck diagrams. Uh, they're based on more recent data. And there's a difference between um, the way tieback loading uh, is applied and the passive strut loading. For the tiebacks are going to be installed. You know, one of the issues about struts is you, re you relieve almost all the load on the wall, then you put the struts in the tiebacks, since they're placed right at, they can place right at the bottom of the excavation. You can actually get them in and, and tension them uh, uh, in, a, in a better fashion. You, you can get less stress relief in the soil behind the wall from tiebacks than you do in struts. So the earth pressure diagrams actually uh, uh, are generated by different phenomena in these two. So the, those are the, big, the big differences are basically more data, and the system loads the walls differently. So this is the, the um, so I, what I thought I'd do is, obviously, anybody can go into the design manual, pull off the, the earth pressure diagrams, and press ahead. But they're different than the other ones, so I thought it would be important. I thought it's, it's, it's important to take a, a few minutes to show how these compare to the earth pressure diagrams that we're using uh, for braced excavations. So this is the earth pressure diagram. Uh, that's specified by FHWA for a single strand anchor. So this is a wall where you have just one anchor placed at the top of the wall. So your, your free body diagram for the wall, you've got some reaction at the base which comes from the soil. All, it, it, it's a, an equivalent reaction from all the soil below the base. And then you've got an anchor load uh, at the point that you put your anchors on. And the, the recommended anchor um, earth, pre the earth pressure diagram is this. It's this trapezoidal one, where um, the first break point is two thirds of the height, the depth of the first anchor, and the second break point is two thirds of the way up from the bottom, between the bottom and the and the anchor location. And then the maximum stress in this earth pressure diagram is equal to what they call the total load uh, divided by two thirds times h, which they say is approximately equal to Ka gamma h, which sounds pretty fishy. So let's go back and look at that. Remember from our PEC diagram for, oh, by the way, I, I missed this. We're talking about, this is the diagram for sands. Just like uh, for the PEC diagrams, we're going to have different diagrams for clays versus sands. So this is for sands. Remember the PEC diagram for sands was 0 0.65 Ka gamma H, right? So the total load in that diag, the, the, the total load it, within that envelope <coughs> Excuse me. The total load within an envelope is 0.65 Ka gamma h squared, right? That's the area of that rectangle. Um, so the specific, the, the 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 stress, the maximum stress in the earth pressure diagram, which they're calling P, is is said specified as being the total load divided by two thirds uh, h. So the total load, if the total load from the PEC diagram is 0 0.65 Ka gamma H, two thirds of that, so what's that? That's 0 0.65 Ka gamma H divided by 0 0.67. So that's approximately equal to Ka gamma H. It's not that there's some theoretical reason for it being that way, that just turns out that way. So don't don't put some don't put some Theoretical, theoretical significance to that. These are, again, empirical earth pressure diagrams that are generated from uh, field data. But it's handy to remember that, that for a single loaded pile wall, the maximum stress of the trapezoid is, is essentially going to be Ka gamma H. Uh, for multiple anchors, we're going to get a different uh, um, envelope. Uh, and the shape of the envelope's different, although it's, it's, it, it's philosophically the same. The uh, first break is two-thirds of the, the depth to the first um, anchor, and the break at the bottom is two-thirds of the spacing from the bottom anchor to the top. But P is defined differently. And if we go back again and look at um, the Trutsagi and Peck diagram, remember, 0 0.65 um, Ka gamma is a peak stress from the PEC diagram. And so there's this area in these little triangles that's not within the, that's in the PEC diagram, that's not in this one. And so essentially what this 
earth pressure diagram is doing is it's taking that load from the, the that load from the PEC diagrams that was distributed to the top and the bottom and redistributing that load into the center of the earth pressure envelope where the anchors are actually operating, which makes, which makes sense. So that's what's going, uh, sorry. So that's what's essentially what's happening here. The, the, the total load is again still approximately equal to, or well is equal to 0 0.65 gamma H, but what we're doing is re redistributing some of that load that from the old diagrams was, was occurring at the top and the bottom into the area where the tendons are actually going to exist. <clears throat> so for, um, and so those are both for sands. And for clays, remember for the, for the PEC diagram, we had different ones from, for, for uh, stiff, these are for the stiff to hard clays, not for the soft clays. Um, and remember the, the, the PEC diagram had a trapezoidal shape like that where, um, I'm sorry, let me back up here. So we're saying that the, the, uh, the this is going to correspond, th this pr pr pressure envelope here of 0 0.2 gamma H to 0 0.4 gamma H is corresponding to a total load of 0 0.7 uh, gamma H squared to 0 0.33 gamma H squared. And remember that from our, our Tritsagi and Peck envelope, it was slightly different. The, the shape of the top of the envelope is the same. In this case, the shape of the bottom envelope, we're actually moving load into, we're, we're putting the stresses closer to the tendon. And the, um, the total force in the Tritsagi and Peck envelope was about 0 0.15 to 0 0.3. So the, the envelope for, um, anchors actually has a higher capacity, in the clays, has a higher capacity. You're getting more uh, total anchorage load in the clays than you are in, uh, than we used for the braced excavations. That's because we can mobilize more load in the clays with the anchor systems than we can with the brace systems. Because remember, for the clays, your anchors, your, your anchors is basically limited by the displacement you need, and for the, for the, when, when you're when, and when you put in the braces, since you essentially have to unload the wall and then come in and put the brace in, because you can't really put the brace at the bottom of the excavation, you can get more load transferred into the tendon. So the, for, for the stiff clays, you actually have more area in the um, load uh, diagram for anchors than you do for clays. Uh, and with multiple anchors, um, the concept is the same at the bottom of the top, the, the break points, two-thirds of the distance from here or two-thirds of the distance from there. Uh, for soft clays, um, the design is different. Um, remember the Trisagi and Peck uh, envelope, uh, we used um, um, M times 4 times SU, and remember N, M was equal to 0.4 for that were for cuts that were underlain by a deep soft layer, and M was equal to one for the ones that weren't un underlain by a really deep soft layer. Remember that was just an empirical way to to match the loads that we saw in the um, uh, Norwegian um, database where they had deep, deep soft clays. Well, that doesn't really have anything. That, that what we're really saying is the earth pressures are different when we have soft material below the base rather than above. So. Um, we did not explicitly in that system consider the depth of the soft layer under the clay. We just said, hey, there's cases where we got a strong foundation and there's cases where we got soft underneath. Well, obviously, if, if you have soft material and you get your sheet pile wall closer and closer to the base, it shouldn't just go from soft to perfectly stiff. There should be some kind of, some kind of relationship between the depth of the soft material underneath the clay. So the earth pressure diagrams for the soft clays in the FHWA manual, used a completely different analysis. So Hinkle did an analysis for um, a material where he um, s s specified the undrained shear strength of the material above the base of the excavation and that below the excavation. And he also explicitly in, in included the depth above the stiff layer. So this is a stiff or competent layer. This 
is your soft clay. You can have a different um, shear strength above and below. He also included space for a, a bench and stuff at the top because that's often done. Um, and we're not going to derive this equation, but this is, uh, for that failure envelope, this is the um, earth pressure diagram that you get. I mean, this is the way you calculate Ka for this, for this failure envelope. This is, what you, what you do with this failure envelope is you calculate the total force that you need to uh, maintain the, 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 uh, the wall, and then just divide that uh, uh, into the, by the vertical stress, and you're going to get the, uh, the uh, Ka. So this is what that equation looks like. We're not going to derive it. But we are going to um, um, talk about his data. So uh, if you um, plot Hinkle's data as the lateral earth pressure coefficient is a function of the stability number. Remember, the, st the stability number is, um, let's see, i got to get this straight. Uh, N is uh, gamma H over SU, right? So big stability numbers means, you know, big, st big stability numbers are bad and small stability numbers are, are good, right? Big, st big stability numbers mean a lot of load, gamma, a large gamma H, and small stability numbers mean a high SU. So as we, um, so this is the, the Ka uh, as a function of stability number. So this is Tursagi and Peck's recommendation for um, m is equal to 1. So that's the case where you have a competent base. This is Tursagi and Peck's recommendation for the case where m is equal to 0 0.4, so that was the case, uh, remember, for the, Norwe the Norwegian walls where we have uh, a soft base underneath and we saw much higher earth pressures. Now Hinkle's design, Hinkle's uh, analysis, let's see, let's try purple. Hinkle's analysis, he has analyses for different D over H's. So for a D over H of 0 0.1, so that's for a very small d. d is the depth below the excavation, right? This is d. Um, this is h. So for a d over h that's very small, that means the wall comes almost down to the stiff layer, right? And a d over h that's large means that you have a, a greater area below the base. So as a, for, for a small d over h, this is Henkel's recommended earth pressure, or comp I recommended, computed earth pressure for, um, as a function of the stability number. And notice that it's a little higher, but very close to the Tertsagi one for the, for the case where you have a competent or stiff base, right? And then notice as d over h gets larger, Hinkle's diagram moves in this way. So this is for, this is for uh, d over h increasing. So for a given, excuse me, for a given stability number, so for a given ratio of gamma h over su, as we, as we raise the base of the wall above the, uh, above the stiff layer, we're going to get higher and higher active earth pressures, which, which makes sense. As we get farther above the, the base, as the wall goes up, we're going to have, it's going to be easier for us to get this bearing capacity failure under here, and it's going to generate higher uh, lateral earth pressures. Whereas the wall goes down, then there's going to be less chance of this basal failure, and we're going to get lower lateral earth pressures. The other thing that's important to note is that for most cases, Hinkle's earth pressures are greater than those that you're going to generate from the Tritsagi and Peck envelopes. So you notice for most cases, they're greater, they're greater than the ones you can generate. Remember, this is the one, the, the red one at the bottom is Tritsagi and Peck's for a strong base, and this is, uh, this is essentially the Hinkle one. So the recommendations are when, um, when your stability number is less than 5.14, that's right here. Um, whoops. Uh, 
Henkel's analysis doesn't apply, and you should be using your Ka of 0 0.22, which is the one we got from Terzaghi and Peck, right? When uh, Ns is between, uh, uh, when Ns is greater than 7, and D over H is less than 0 0.5, so that's when you're down in this region down in here. In that ca case, you can just use the Trutsagi and Peck with the M is equal to 0 0.4, and you should be fine. So you're actually going to use this envelope right here. Otherwise, um, you should be using Henkel's equation for Ka. So you're going to get higher lateral loads with Henkel's equation than you get from Trutsagi and Pex. But th remember, these are, these are the apparent earth pressure <laughs> diagrams that we're going to get. You know, and, and, and this comes partly because we're putting higher loads in our tendons for the, for the tie backs than we would be putting in the struts. And so we're, we're going to get higher earth pressure. So remember, this is, all, this is all related to apparent earth pressure coefficients or earth pressure diagrams. OK. So that's nice. So now we know how to, now we know how to generate the um, earth pressure uh, envelopes. Um, how are we going to compute the, uh, but by that, that Hinkle analysis only applies to the soft clay problem. Right? Let me, let me, let me go back and review this real quick because I want to make sure this is clear. Um, OK, for sand, if we have a single anchor, we're going to use this envelope. This total force, this total force is you're, you're actually going to compute from a wedge analysis of, of the, the which, which I'm not going to cover, but it's in a design manual, from a wedge analysis, the total force required. I'm comparing that here with the total force from the Trutsagi and Peck one, but this is the total force that's going to be required and, and you're just going to compute the, um, um, the, the P then is going to, how you distribute that, that total, um, um, the, 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 total the total stabilizing force that you need for the wall across the face of the wall. In the case where there's multiple anchors, you're going to be doing the same thing. You're just going to be distributing it slightly differently. This is how it compares to the Trutsagi one. Um, and then for the, for the stiff to hard clays, um, you're going to be using these values for the envelopes. Remember the stiff to the hard clays are the ones where you have very little data. They don't need a lot of, they don't need a lot of uh, um, support anyway because they are stiff. And then for the soft clays, uh, we're going to use this diagram, but the, but the Ka we're going to use uh, depends on, let's skip all that, the Ka that you're going to use, you should be following this procedure. For n less than, than um, uh, 0 .1, 0 0.51, we're just going to use 0 0.22. Um, for n, between, n less than 7, but dh relatively low, we're just going to use Trutsagi and Pex with m is equal to um, um, 0 0.4, so that's the solid line. So in here, you're going to use this one. And then everything else, you need to use Hinkle's equation. So that's how you're going to calculate the total loads. OK, how, now that we have the earth pressure diagrams, how are we going to get those loads into the tendons? So this is, again, it's, um, it's an indeterminate structural problem, but we're going to simplify it to figure out how to do that. The one, there's two ways to do that. One's the tributary area method, and with the tributary area method, all we're going to do is we're going to come, we're going to come halfway between here and here. We're going to draw a line, say this whole load goes to here, and uh, this whole load is going to go to there, and that's how we determine the load that's actually in the tendon. With the hinge method, what we're actually going to do is we're going to assume that we have, whoops, we're going to assume that we have a, a zero moment here. We're actually we're going to calculate the moments about here and, and determine the total earth pressure load based on the assumption that we have zero moment here, which isn't exactly right, but it's, but it's close. So you're going to take the, the, the total force of this, of this entire envelope. You're going to put the total force here, calculate that moment arm, and then calculate, knowing the load that you got there, you're going to calculate that, and that'll give you your tendon load there. 
They're both approximate. They both work adequately. Um, for um, um, for multiple tiebacks, we can then uh, use a tributary area method where we're just going to divide the the low the uh, apparent earth pressure diagram up into blocks halfway between each uh, support location, or we can use the hinge method. In the hinge method, um, we're going to assume that there's hinges formed at each one of these joints separately, and then calculate the. Um, um, we're actually, we're, we actually do this. We, we assume there's a hinge there to calculate this load. We assume the hinge there to calculate the reaction down there, and then we're going to split the reaction. We, we'll get these, we'll get these um, reactions on the, from the top and the, and the center based on our different equations, and we're going to add those together to get the loads there. Um, and then um, the total horizontal force is then uh, Ti times the anchor spacing. So this is the so, so remember, these are going to be these loads like T1 are going to be force per unit length into the paper, right? But our anchors aren't continuous, so now we've got to figure out what's load on each anchor. So that's going to depend on the spacing of the anchors. Uh, this is the horizontal spacing. So the load on each anchor is going to be this T times the horizontal spacing. That makes sense. So now that's the horizontal load on the wall uh, in the anchor. But our anchors aren't horizontally oriented, right? Notice we've been using TH through all this. Uh, there's, some ori there's some angle to the anchors theta. So the total load on the anchors is going to be at that angle theta. So obviously the total load has got to be TH divided by cosine theta. Um, So the and then the vertical component of the of the load is going to be uh, t the total load times sine theta. We're going to need to know the vertical component because that's the por portion that's going to be uh, generating forces into the pile that we have to worry about um, capacity of the pile. All right. So um, how do we determine the horizontal anchor spacing? Well, it's, it's limited by the wall spacing. Uh, it, for, for if you're using something like H piles, I mean, you can't just put anchors any place. There's going to have to be some. There's got to be some location in relationship to how the, the H piles are. They don't have, it doesn't have to be exactly equal to the to the H pile spacing. Remember that those photographs we looked from the the gold line extension. They actually put two anchors at a, in between two H piles. So spacing with those anchors those anchors are actually less than. Um, uh, the, than um, um, S, and then and that that particular excavation did not have a uniform spacing anchors across it. It was also a fairly fairly sh narrow uh, excavation that particular one I was showing you. But there's going to be some geometry of the wall that's going to control spacing. And generally speaking, the the maximum spacing uh, or the minimum spacing should be either four feet or three times the expected diameter of the anchorage zone, and that's the final diameter. If you're if you're post grouting or grout or doing pressure grouting, it's the di it's not the diameter you drill, it's the diameter that you expect to actually form the the anchor zone, and that that'll be substantially larger than the the than the diameter that you drill if you're using grouted or post grouted anchors. So that's that's the minimum. Uh, in fact. Um, uh, there's reason that the closer you get the anchor, there's a trade-off between the closer you get the anchors together, obviously the lower the anchor loads, so the less uh, cost of, of the tendons and everything in the anchors, but then that means the more anchors you've got to put in. So there's a trade-off there between spacing and, and, and cost and constructability. So the fewer anchors you have to put in, the less cost to install them, but then you've got to put in more bigger and, and more complex and more expensive anchors. So there's a, there's a trade-off there. And I'm not qualified to tell you how to make that trade-off. That's a construction design issue. In terms of the vertical location, there are several things to consider. First of all, we, we, have, we want a minimum depth of the anchorage zone of 15, of 15 feet or 4.5 meters. That's to ensure that we have enough capacity, uh, vert, that we have enough vertical stress on our anchor to actually get the full capacity of the anchor. So you never want to put any anchors in at depths less than 15 feet. 
We also want have a minimum spacing, this spacing chi here, behind the failure surface. You want the end of your anchorage zone to be uh, at least 5 feet or 0.2 h for those of you that decoded the things, this is a correction, it's not 2h, but 0.2h um, times the height of the wall. You want that distance to be behind there so that you're, so you're sufficiently behind the, the failure surface that your, your loads in your anchorage area aren't affecting what's going on in the failure surface. Um, so you can compute the unbonded length um, using the geometry from this figure, then, if you know, you know that the lowest anchor, where the lowest anchor is going to go in, you know that you know where your potential failure surface is as 45 minus v over 2, and then you're going to go uh, uh, 5 feet or 0.2 times h behind that, and then that'll give you your unbonded length. So this is your minimum unbonded length. Now it could be that you're trying to go to a competent material. You know, if you're if you're if you if you're uh, um, material was such that you had a more, more competent material down here than above, then this first anchor would be good, but the second anchor might have to go all the way back here to get into that competent material. So this also can be driven by the, the uh, soil conditions. So realize this is, this is assuming that, that you have a uniform material in there. Um, the other thing I'll say is, this also depends on what kind of obstructions you have and what, you, what kind of obstructions you're trying to get around. Sometimes that'll drive what's going on, too. Um, all right, so once we've got that done, um, we got our apparent earth pressure diagrams. Now we can compute the moments in, in the sheeting, and we can pick an, uh, an appropriate section. Uh, this section of the, of the manual shows you how to do that. We need to determine, determine the... the um, embedment depth required um, by our facing system, whether they're H piles or whatever it is. Um, the, first, the first thing we're going to do is, is make sure that we have enough lateral embedment to make sure that we, that we don't have any toe kick out. And that procedure is essentially the same as we did for H piles. Uh, and that's shown in, in this section of the manual. Um, but we also now have to check the vertical bearing capacity, particularly if you have steep anchors. Because you're gonna, you can put a significant vertical load on your anchor. Remember, we're definitely going to have a vertical component to each of these. And if you have really steep anchors, like this happens sometimes that you have competent material down here and incompetent material up there, in which case you've got to get your anchors down into here. In these case, you could have very steep anchors. You could have very large loads. You've got to make sure that you don't have a bearing capacity failure down here. So, so the, the depth of embedment in that case might be greater just to get enough um, um, incapacity. So that's really a deep foundations problem, uh, which we're not talking about in this class. Um, but the procedures are covered for you. It's, it's basically a normal pile capacity uh, uh, design. The procedures are, are, are covered in that section of the manual. Um, we're not going to go into any detail on that because it's really covered in the deep foundations class. Uh, but you, essentially, it's a deep foundations pile analysis to make sure that you have the capacity below grade to take the vertical loads in your pile. So that's what it conceptually is. If you want some details, it's there. If you want to really understand it, you need to take the deep foundations class. All right. So now we know our unbonded length. It's going to be driven by the geometry and, and all those things. We know, the, we know the depth, the length of the pile. Now we've got to design our anchorage. Um, so the, the minimum unbonded length, uh, um, if, uh, if, if the geometry doesn't drive this, there are minimum unbonded lengths. And for bars, it's 10 feet. And for strand and tendons, it's 15 feet. Um, you can do. Um, um, you can do some uh, designs that are very simple for what we call small diameter and gravity uh, grouted anchors. So this is for relatively small walls. Uh, so if you have design loads that are, that are less than 250 kips, um, and you have total anchorage lengths that are less than 30 to 60 meters, then um, you can use uh, these small diameter gravity anchors. Um, the ins you, you always want some angle on the on the the the, um, the anchor hole because you want if you're using gravity grouting you want to make sure the grout actually stays in the bottom of the hole. 
So generally 15 to 30 degrees. 15 is definitely, a, well, minimum is 10, but 15 to 30 is more common. The maximum is 45. Um, these things can put in with can be put in with relatively simple systems and doesn't require uh, as much sophistication. Doesn't require uh, a very high pressure grout pump, for instance, to do regrouting or anything. And um, they use relatively small holes. And there are a lot of moderate earth retention problems. If you have soils that ha that are either uh, fairly stiff clays or there's, you're in sands that aren't and it's not very deep, you've got relatively low loads. These are very simple systems to install, and and um, and they don't require as much analysis as the larger systems do. So uh, for small diameter uh, gravity grouted systems, these are. I want to emphasize the word estimates in here. Right? And I think in some cases I might have added these today since you printed your things. You you are not going to theoretically determine the capacity of the anchor by taking the grout pressure and estimating the lateral earth pressure around the area where you grout and the cohesion, the adhesion of that. We determine anchor capacity by installing anchors and pulling on them until they fail and estimating the capacities from that. So these are all based on empirical data. And if you go to the uh, designers of these things, they've all got their own proprietary systems for installing anchors, installing things, and grouting them. And they're not going to tell you exactly what their capacities are or how they get it. And, 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 and that's why a lot of these systems go in design build, because they can go into the system and, and they, they, they're going to know from the soil sampling and how it's set up what kind of anchor loads they can get in here and how they're going to install their anchors and all those details to it. So these are really just ways for you, the designer, to estimate uh, what the anchorage length you're going to need is and whether you're going to have to, whether you can use. Uh, uh, a, a gravity grouted system, a trimming system, or that you're going to need a, uh, a pressure grouted system, or you need a, a back, a, a post grouted system. Um, and then once you've got a design, you think you know what your anchor lengths are, you think you know what your bond distances are, then you're going to go out, you're going to install a few, you're going to pull them out, make sure that they have the capacity, and, and then adjust your design. So, in which, so I want to emphasize that all these things are estimates, but this is how you get your problem started. So these are a function of the type of soil, its consistency. For in a case of um, sands and gravels, whether it's whether its relative density is. In a case of um, silty materials, um, what it's stiff, whether whether it's stiff or soft, what its unconfined compression strength is. And here is an estimated transfer load that you can get in kips per foot. So for these small grouted systems, we're just assuming that we get. We're not. We're not concerned about the area of the of the hole. We're saying if you have a low if for these low capacity grouted systems where you're using holes that are um, six to twelve inches in diameter, and you're following all these guidelines, then your capacities, you can estimate your capacities just in kips per foot of the of the bonded uh, of the of the anchored zone. So you can come in here, let's, let's say you've got a, uh, you got from your earth pressure diagrams, you're going to have 150 kips in your um, anchor, and you're going to be in, in a medium sand. You can estimate that you're going to get 10 kips uh, per foot. So that means your bonded length is going to be uh, 15 feet long. That makes sense? All right. And these. You're going to end up with these systems with typical bond lengths that are less than 40 feet. Um, the typical factors of safety we use are two. Now, for um, for large anchors, um, we're going to actually estimate our bond strength actually as a stress that we're going to generate around the outside of the grouted region. So now we're going to have to know the diameter of the, gra of, the, of the bonded region as well as its length in order to estimate it. So for the, for the, the higher capacity systems, we're going to be gener specifying our bond stress in um, a KSF, or I mean, these are from the, uh, they, they could be specified in MPA, but for the, uh, the US units, they're in KSF. And here's, uh, again, this comes directly out of your FHWA manual. But those are the bond systems for gravity grouted systems and for pressure grouted systems for these different kinds of materials. This is all for fine grain soils.
So in this case, you're going to have to specify, um, sorry, in this case, you have to, you're going to have to know the diameter of the anchor zone, as, and then you have to estimate that, and then you can determine the length knowing that, because that, the, the diameter, 2 pi times the diameter, or pi times the diameter times the length is going to give the area of the grouted region. So for the gravity grouted ones, that diameter is going to be the diameter of the hole you drill. For the pressure grouted ones, it's going to be the diameter of the, of the grouted region once you grout it. So you'll have to have, have a way to estimate that. Here's the same material. Again, estimates for coarse grain soils. And you notice that these values are significantly higher than you get in the um, sands. And notice. There's a significant range in these, 1.8 to 7.9, 5 to 30. So there's a factor of 4 in there. So this reflects that the, um, the, these are just um, empirical estimates. And this reflects the variability of the ways these things are actually installed and the systems used. Um, all, every, every contractor that does this will, will know from, they'll have their own database of materials they put, they've grouted. What, what the method was they installed them in and what capacity they got them out of them. And they'll have their own little tables of this that they'll use for design estimates. So these ones compiled in the FHWA manual are, again, they're just estimates to get you started. Uh, for load transfer in rocks, um, again, we, for, the, for load transfer in rocks, we're generally using small, relatively small diameter holes. Again, we're back to estimating loads just in the, the load capacity per foot of the anchored region. Here's how you can do that based on rock types. Um, there is a minimum bond length of 10 feet. Rock anchors generally don't require long bond lengths because you can get fairly high capacities out of them. Uh, typical factors of safety are three for competent rock and, and two for, for weak rock or strong soil. The, the issue with competent rock is you can get brittle fractures in it. Um, we're not going to be designing rock anchors at all. So some notes on the, on the anchor capacity. Um, this is probably the, at least the third, if not the fourth time I've said it. These are just giving you estimates of initial capacities that you can use to, to estimate the bond lengths that you're going to need in your system so that you know how to estimate costs of things. You're going to have to actually go to the site, install anchors, do test anchors, the initial ones, and make sure that you got the capacity. If it's a small project and it's a low risk project, you can over design them and just put them in and not worry about it. If it's a big project and there's a lot of cost savings, then you're actually going to you're going to want to go out there and do some preliminary testing, and then redesign to, for to optimize the system. Um, the people that do this for a living have better estimates than those ones, and they're not going to tell you what they are because that's their competitive advantage. Um, if you're in uh, practitioners in local areas, we'll know more about the bond. You know, if, if you're working in San Diego, the guys can tell you in the terrace deposits in San Diego, they got really good estimates of what the bond capacities they can get out of certain kinds of systems down there because they've worked in it a long time. So that's another way you can do these if you're in a local area. Do um, you have any comments on any of these comments so far? Uh, it, ours vary greatly from project to project. We don't install the anchors ourselves. Oh, so you guys actually sub out the. But you got, but, but you must, but if you, but you, but you do, but you're doing the design, right? Yeah. So, so is is that? Do you know if there's um, how much interaction there is between the designers, between your designers and the actual installers on that? Is there, is there a fair amount of conversation during design on there, or do you know? So, uh, we're just now starting the first project that we've done design on since I've been there. Okay. So. It's not black magic, but there's a lot of empiricism in it, which, which makes sense because there's a lot of things going on. Um, your final design should be based on field tests. Make sure you're doing the field tests. The only time I wouldn't do that is if it's a really simple project and you can afford to over-design it and be ultra-conservative. Even then, you're going to be testing all the anchors because you, you have to put a, you have to put a, a jack on every anchor to, to, to install it, so you always test them even if it's a quick test. Um, so this requires our uh, famous observational method that Peck developed, and it's a good way to go. So I could have titled this whole project, I could have titled this whole presentation is instead of design of anchors, is how to estimate anchor designs. 
And then the real anchors are going to be designed once you go to the field and finish your installation. And I think we have reached the end of the quarter. Any questions? So all I'm going to be so one of the questions I'm sure that you either are afraid to ask right now or haven't thought to ask yet is so what am I actually going to ask you to do this? I'm just asking if I ask you to do anchor designs, it's going to be figuring out the lengths of the anchors based on geometry and estimating the anchor zones based on the materials in this kind of just table look up. I'm going to need it, you know, this is the system I'm putting in, this is the length of the anchor, this is the grouted zone I'm going to need. That's all, that's all we're asking you to do. Draw, figure out what the earth pressure diagrams are, calculate your loads on the anchors that are in there, and then being able to estimate the bond lengths. Can I give you an example problem to work on? Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I probably could. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll say there are example problems in the FHWA manual. So I could give you one of those. I'll have to look. If, if I've got one that's done and i got an answer for it, I'll put it up. Otherwise, th there, there are example problems in there for you guys to use. So, and all the design guidelines are there. I'm not going to ask you to do the whole design. All, my, the, the, all, all you need to be able to do is to be able to estimate, the, calculate the bonded and unbonded length, cal calculate the unbonded length based on geometry, and then calculate the bonded length based on estimates from these tables. Okay? Any other questions?